Good morning again. We are going to be in Ruth chapter 2 today, Ruth 2. Go ahead and turn there uh, with me in your Bibles, Ruth 2. And uh, let's begin today uh, in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your continued kindness to us. We recognize that we are weak and fickle people and that we are in need of uh, stability and steadfastness. We have a great need to cling to someone outside of ourselves that can bring grace and order and joy and life into our lives, and we cling to Christ. We acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We ask that you might help us now as we look at this passage in front of us, that you may help us to uh, find refuge under your wings, as uh, Ruth did so many years ago, that we might be able to point to your majesty and your glory and your honor. We pray in Christ. So we find ourselves in Ruth chapter 2, and uh, in today's passage, we really are going to see... Um, how the Lord provides for Ruth and Naomi and sets up the scene and the stage for Ruth chapter 3. Now remember, we have been talking for the last several weeks and we have acknowledged the fact that Ruth and Naomi are incredibly vulnerable. They're two widowed women. They have come from Moab uh, back to Israel. And Ruth would have been better off, if we're talking strictly in terms of her safety, Ruth would have been better off going back to her father's home, but she is committed to Naomi, and so both of them find themselves, as we close chapter 1, in Israel at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, the issue that they face at this point, they've survived the journey. The issue at this point is uh, how to survive. They have no means of income, and they have to face kind of this cruel world in order to just get by. And so we're just going to jump right into Ruth 2. Let's read the chapter together uh, and, and get right into the passage. Now, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of excellence of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one whom I may find favor in his eyes. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she went, and she came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And it so happened that she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May Yahweh be with you. And they said to him, May Yahweh bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? The young man in charge of the reapers replied, She is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the fields of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came and has remained from the morning until now. She has been sitting in the house for a little while. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Have you not heard, my daughter? Do not go to glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my young women. Let your eyes be on the field with which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the young men not to touch you. And if you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the young men draw. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me, though I am a foreigner? Boaz replied to her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you forsook your father and your mother in the land of your birth and came to a people you did not previously know. May Yahweh repay fully your work, and may your wages be full from Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Then she said, May I find favor in your eyes, my Lord? For you have comforted me, and indeed have spoken to the heart of your servant woman, though I am not like one of your servant women. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here, that you may eat of the bread and dip of the piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers, and he served her roasted grain, After she ate, and she ate and was satisfied and had some left. Then she rose to glean, and Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves. Do not dishonor her. 
and you shall purposefully pull out for her some grain from the bundles and leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she went out uh, and then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. She took it up and went to the city and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also took it out and gave Naomi uh, what she had left after she was satisfied. Her mother-in-law then said to her, where did you glean today and where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. She told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man whom I worked today is Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed of Yahweh, who has not forsaken his loving kindness to the living and to the dead. Then Naomi said to her, this man is our relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. And Ruth the Moabitess said, Further, he said to me, You shall stay close to my young men until they have finished all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with with his young women, so that others do not oppress you in another field. So she stayed close by to the young women of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Ruth chapter 1 was what we might call act 1 of the book of Ruth. The context was given, the stage was set for the rest of the book. We saw God's sovereignty on display as all of the events were providentially directed in order to bring Naomi and Ruth back to Israel for the remainder of the book. It was um, what we called the butterfly effect, right? This one famine set into motion, all of these events that would happen, and everything was sovereignly ordained and planned and orchestrated by God who knew what he was doing from the very beginning. And so now we find ourselves at the beginning of Ruth 2, or we might call this Act 2. And we pick up the narrative in verse 1, and we read, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of excellence of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Now, this verse is significant uh, culturally uh, because of the culture of the day, and it's significant for us to understand what exactly is going on in verse 1 because we've lost uh, a bit of the culture uh, from Israel's day. Boaz was a kinsman or a relative to Elimelech. You guys remember who Elimelech is, right? This was Naomi's husband who died in Moab. And this is important because a relative was needed in order to act on behalf of Naomi and to act on behalf of Ruth. And so let me give you a little bit of biblical context. In the days of Israel, a relative could redeem or speak on behalf of a relative really for three big things, okay? The first one is that a relative could redeem another relative out of slavery, okay? There is a person who has become in debt and has gotten into slavery and as a slave, and a relative could come redeem this person out of slavery. And so Leviticus 25 gives us some instructions on this. Leviticus 25 in verse 47. Now, if the means of a sojourner or of a foreign resident with you become sufficient and a brother of yours becomes so poor with regard to him as to sell himself as a sojourner who resides with you or the descendants of a sojourner's family, then he shall have redemption right after he has been sold. One of his brothers may do what? May redeem him. Or his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him. One of his blood relatives from his family may redeem him. Or if he prospers, he may redeem himself. Okay, so the first thing that a relative could do um, is they could redeem another relative out of slavery. That's number one. Okay, secondly... Uh, a relative could redeem land, okay? And we see this in Leviticus 25, in verse 25. If a brother of yours becomes so poor, he has to sell part of his possession of land, then his nearest kinsman redeemer is to come and redeem what his brother has been has sold. Now, you may recall, uh, again, some more cultural context from this day, is that the Lord told Israel not to sell the land um, forever, 
um, this land essentially could be rented, as it were, to someone else. But this redeemer could come along and buy this land back so that it remained in the family forever, okay? Uh, so that your children and grandchildren could continue to possess this same land. And you could sell a part of your land temporarily if you became impoverished in some way. But then this redeemer, this kinsman redeemer, could come and buy this portion of land back. That's the second thing that this close relative could do, is redeem land. And the third thing, um, probably the most foreign to us, is that this relative could raise up children for a man who dies prematurely so that his name is not extinguished um, in Israelite history. And we see this in Deuteronomy 25. If brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, then the wife of the one who died shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it will be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. Okay? Uh, Again, this is probably something that sounds a little bit more foreign to our own ears, but the brother would marry the widow of his brother, and the first child that they had together would uh, essentially receive all the inheritance rights of the brother who died and would carry on that family name so that his name would not be blotted out from Israel. Okay, So there's these three main things. This kinsman redeemer, this close relative redeemer, could um, buy a relative out of slavery, number one, Uh, Number two, could redeem land. And number three, could raise up offspring for uh, the deceased. And what this really does uh, in Israel's day is it really prevents the poor and the widow and the fatherless from being taken advantage of. This actually, these three things, uh, are evidences of God's kindness to his people to make sure that they don't become oppressed in some way. This kinsman was acting on behalf of, of their relative. Uh, Not exactly the same thing, but today we may think of an executor of a will. Again, a lot of differences, but you're acting on behalf of someone else, essentially, and that's, that's what's going on here. God was interested, as we see here, in protecting the most vulnerable in society. Naomi and Ruth find themselves in a very vulnerable position. They needed protection. They could be taken advantage of, and so in the law, the Lord has made provision for them, okay? Now, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, okay, because we're only in verse 1 right now, okay? Elimelech and Boaz. Boaz is a relative of Elimelech. We don't know how close of a relative. Some suggest it was even his brother, although I don't think that's the case, uh, particularly because later on in Ruth, we find out that there's a closer kinsman redeemer than, than Boaz. Um, in any event, they're related to one another. And uh, Boaz is described in this passage as a mighty man of excellence. He's, a, he's a, a godly man, a God-fearing man. And so moving on here, we note that Ruth, that's, that's kind of set up for us and then set to the side, okay? Ruth doesn't know about this connection. We're just told this piece of information from the narrator. And so Ruth now, beginning in verse 2, wants to go and glean in the fields. She hopes that she um, will find favor. And so beginning in verse 2, Ruth the Moabitess says to Naomi, let me go and glean among the ears of grain after one whom I may find favor in his eyes. And she says, go my daughter. And so she went. Ruth goes into the field now, into the fields. And she came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And it so happened that she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Ruth plans on taking advantage of a Hebrew form of charity that was something else baked into Israelite law. God had made another provision. You can see here all throughout the law that God is making provision for those who are vulnerable and weak and helpless. And we just saw three provisions to redeem someone out of these different situations. 
And now we see another provision. God said in his law that landowners were not permitted to strip their fields bare. Okay? When it is time to harvest from your field, God specifically said, don't go over it a second time. Don't harvest the corners or around the edges. Don't go pick up the stuff that falls down. Leave all of that. And that provision was made for the poor. And I'm going to uh, read this provision. Leviticus 19, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap where? To the very corners of your field. Nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. Nor shall you glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the afflicted and the sojourner. I am Yahweh your God. By the way, I love Leviticus. Um, Leviticus is like kind of uh, the read through the Bible in a year graveyard, you know, where everyone gets to Leviticus, but they never make it out of Leviticus, okay? <laughs> um, don't do that. Read through Leviticus. One of the big themes in Leviticus, by the way, is the holiness of God. And I love this statement that you see in Leviticus over and over and over again. I am Yahweh your God, uh, or I am the Lord your God. And it's just like God is, he's, he's giving the ultimate reason why we're to do what we do, okay? Why should you do this? Because God said so. <laughs> why should I do this? Because I am God. And it's just, you do this, and there's no, there's no debate here, there's no argument, there's no, well, could we do this, could we do that? I am Yahweh your God. And that's, there's a period after that, it's over with, okay? And you see this in Leviticus over and over again. So don't get sidetracked in Leviticus. Keep plowing through uh, that particular book. Um, but you see these little signposts all over that book. What's going on here in Leviticus is God is saying that his people are supposed to be charitable, they're supposed to be kind, and they're supposed to be giving, and they're supposed to provide for the poor. And so we've already seen just a couple of verses into Ruth 2, uh, two major ways in which the Lord provides for those who are destitute. The first one is through this kinsman-redeemer concept, and the second one is through not stripping your fields uh, bare. Uh, this is a form of charity, and by the way, I will say this is a form of charity that is far superior to most forms of charity that we have today, okay? And the reason for this is because the labor involved in this form of charity preserves human dignity and helps people to fulfill the fact that God has called us to work, okay? Work is godly. Work existed before the fall, okay? God does not commend or endorse laziness. God commends hard work, and that's how he's ordered the events of this world. I'm going to read you a quote from Rush Dooney that makes this point uh, from the book of Ruth. He says, this was indeed charity, but charity in which the recipient had to work in that gleaning the fields was hard backbreaking work. It was harder than normal harvesting in that the grain reaped and the fruit picked was all the harder to secure by reason of scarcity. Nevertheless, the person who, had, who gleaned had as a result of his or her work enough to provide for himself and something to sell as a source of income. Widows and orphans usually were the main recipients of the gleaning privilege. Thus work, whereby the recipient gained self-respect and had the satisfaction of taking care of himself in the process was essential. Okay, Work is an essential part of this. Another commentator says about this, the solution to a social problem required that the recipients work hard for their provision and it therefore preserve the dignity that is sometimes forfeited by those who are entirely dependent on the generosity of others. Modern forms of charity undercut this crucial component, okay? Um, I am not saying, don't anyone walk away from your saying, I am not saying that there's never a time to just give to someone as we should be the most generous people on planet earth. We should give. 
without expecting anything in return. Uh, At the same time, work is ordained by God. And we see in Thessalonians that the person who does not work, Paul says, should not eat. There's a connection here that's made. Um, And so we have to remember and be careful that in our forms of modern charity, we do not bypass uh, this important aspect of provision. In any event, all of these things converge together on this passage. God's kindness, his mercy, his patience, his provision, charity, all these things come together. And all of this is the background that the modern reader doesn't necessarily always know when you come straight to the book of Ruth. Ruth works in order to provide for herself and Naomi. God has made provisions in the law for such individuals. And as we will see, Boaz now will go above and beyond to show kindness to her. So let's zoom in here on verse 3. She went, she gleaned in the field after the reapers, and it so happened that she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. The phrase here to note is, it so happened that she happened. I really love how the uh, LSB rendered this phrase. Uh, One commentator says, uh, translates it as, her chance chanced upon. Um, And this really is uh, kind of the sense of the word. Uh, I think most modern translations probably just put she happened, but the LSB has she happened to happen. Um. And this is, this is extracting a theme that we, in our introductory message to Ruth, we said is woven, a thread that actually is like in every verse of Ruth, just woven throughout the entire, and we're kind of just pulling that thread out and seeing it come up again and again and again and again. And that is the theme of providence, of divine providence. And we see in Ruth, as we saw in our introductory message, a number of direct statements about God's providence, Right? It's a number of statements that directly say that God did this. Then we saw also a number of statements in Ruth that were implied statements or or statements where people were trusting God's providence. And then we see in Ruth a whole bunch of these coincidence statements. And you almost get the impression that because the word that's used here is she so happened to happen, that it's kind of almost putting it in quotation marks. Now, Ruth happened to come, or kind of a wink coming after this, Ruth happened, wink, to come upon this portion of the field uh, that belonged to Boaz. And all of this is really to simply say, who's in control? God is sovereignly ordaining and orchestrating these events. Ruth did not just, quote unquote, happen to come. It was not a coincidence. It was not chance. It was all of God's providence Uh, throughout this entire uh, event. God's sovereignty and God's providence is on display. Providence, we might say, is hiding behind every corner in Ruth. What was it then that she happened upon? Well, she happened upon Boaz's field, which now sets us up. These are kind of the introductory verses for Act 2, or Ruth chapter 2, to set us up for the rest of the uh, chapter today. And so we zoom in on Boaz here. Boaz comes back from Bethlehem. He gives them a greeting, may Yahweh be with you. They reply to him, may Yahweh bless you. Boaz uh, asks the young man who's in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? He responds to Boaz, she is the Moabite woman. Remember, everyone knows who they are, right? Because words spread quickly. She's the Moabite woman who returned with Naomi. Um, and she asked to be able to reap, uh, to gather after the reapers, and she's come, and she rested a little while, and this is where we are. Boaz is a God-fearing man. He addresses the workers with a blessing from the Lord, and he asks this one worker in particular about Ruth. The man fills Boaz on all the details, and now Boaz goes directly to Ruth. He's got all the information that he needs, and he goes to her, And he says, have you not heard? Don't go in another field. Stay here. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap. Indeed, I've told the young men not to touch you. And if you're thirsty, we have water here that you can uh, have. 
And what Boaz is doing here is operating out of a spirit of kindness. He's motivated to protect, care for, and provide for Ruth. Now, I want to make a little observation here. Boaz was a man who understood the spirit of the law and not just the letter of the law, okay? And uh, I think this is an interesting point to observe here. We have a tendency today to look at people who go beyond the law, beyond the word of God, and to call them legalists. And a lot of times that is a very fair criticism, okay? There's, there's, there's a lot of truth in that many times. In other situations, it is immensely uh, disingenuous. Um, Boaz could have just said, well, I, God told me not to, to do the corners, so I'm just not going to do the corners and leave it at that. But he goes above and beyond here. He understands that in the law, God has do this and do that, but he also is understanding the heart behind this. What's the heart behind it? Provide for and care for the weak and the poor. And so Boaz says, well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go, I don't, there's nothing that says I only have to do these things. I'm going to go and do these things also. Um, so Boaz recognizes this. And just as a side note here, um, uh, a certain degree of caution is warranted here. Um, just be careful before you criticize your neighbor of legalism, okay? That is oftentimes the case, and sometimes it's not. Um, sometimes we simply look at God's word and say, you know, I'm tempted in these ways and I'm weak in these ways. And I know that I've struggled with this in the past. And so this particular thing is just not helpful for me personally. And I'm just going to set that aside. Maybe that's what they're doing. And maybe you should go and encourage your neighbor to disciple and minister to their own heart, uh, in that particular way. Um, sometimes understanding the spirit of the law means that we do go above and beyond the law. And that's what Boaz is, is doing in this particular situation. Not only does he um, tell Ruth, you can glean in this field, but he makes a commitment to her that she's going to be safe here. In other fields, remember, this is, you remember what, what this, the setting of the book of Ruth? This is during the time of the what? Judges, okay? It's during the time of the judges, okay? The time of the judges was a particularly dark time in Israel's history because what did everyone do? Yes, everyone did what was right in their own eyes, okay? So you have this, this is the backdrop for Ruth, okay? So what, why is this particularly encouraging to Ruth to hear this? Because if she goes in other fields during the time of the judges, when every man does what's right in her, his own eyes, she runs the risk of being assaulted, potentially physically or sexually or whatever. And Ruth or, or, or Boaz promises that she will be protected and safe here. Remember, this is one of the things culturally we said it was very risky for Ruth to do what she did. Where would she have been kept the most safe? Where would she been the safest? Going back to be with her father, okay, until she could remarry. So everything that Ruth has done to demonstrate her commitment to Naomi has, has really put her in a position of incredible risk, personally. And now someone comes along and says, I'm going to protect you and care for you. And so this is what uh, happens. Ruth responds to this with humility. She fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and she says, why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me even though I'm a foreigner? I'm a Moabite. What in the world? There's plenty of poor people here in Israel. Why are you taking notice of me? Boaz responds, and he says that, you know, the 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 Grapevine has been in full operation, and I know, I've heard everything. I've heard the whole story. He says, all that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully told to me, how you forsook your father and mother, 
uh, in the land of your birth and came to a people you did not previously know. And then he says, may Yahweh fully repay your work and may your wages be full from Yahweh. The God of Israel, and this is a significant statement here, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. She's humbled that he notices her, even though she's a Moabite. He replies that the news has reached his ears about what she did for Naomi. He acknowledges that she has come to seek refuge in the true God. We see this also in Psalm 91.4. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will take refuge. Describing the character of our God. Psalm 36, 7, how precious is your loving kindness, O God, and the sons of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Ruth chapter 2 and verse 12, where we are right now, implies something. Namely, it implies that Ruth is a convert to the true God, okay? She has come to take refuge under God's wings. Remember, this is a theme that I'm going to continue to press again and again and again, in the book of Ruth, and that is, Ruth has come to the Lord on whose terms? On God's terms. Okay, do you, do you remember in our introductory message to Ruth, there are some people who come to the book of Ruth and they say, oh, the book of Ruth certainly is a reaction uh, to the uh, harsh uh, uh, books of Nehemiah and Ezra. I mean, those guys were just misogynistic because at the end of Nehemiah and Ezra, you see the harsh, the, these Israelites marry these foreign women and then they come and basically beat these men and, and force them to put these foreign wives off. And so Ruth was written as a reaction to how harsh that was and now we see that God welcomes uh, these people into his midst. Um, the, the first hurdle you have to get through with that kind of a mentality is you have to somehow believe that the Bible is pitted against the Bible and that the, there's not unity in Scripture. It's this passage, these people were a little bit overboard, and so now this passage is written, and it's this kind of thing, and then you just pick and choose what you want to take from Scripture. Okay, that's a problem. And, uh, and, and we'll deal with that problem on another day, okay? But for the sake of Ruth here, understand that the difference between these two passages is that in Nehemiah and Ezra, those foreign wives that they married drew them away from the true God. Okay? Ruth comes to the true God on his terms. That's a very significant difference and we said that one of the ways that this plays out in modern day in our app, as we apply this is um, the fact that Jesus ate with sinners, right? And what we said is that Jesus did not do this to affirm them in their sin, but to call them out of their sin. And our engagement, interaction with the world is to be the same way. Guess what? Whoever repents and believes in the gospel can be saved. Everyone's invited, welcome. Okay. But you have to repent and believe to be saved. And that's the key difference here. Ruth has come to take refuge under Yahweh's wings, an implication of her salvation, whereas the situation in Nehemiah and Ezra were completely different. So context is always important as we look at these passages. In verse 13, she says, "'May I find favor in your eyes, my Lord?' For you have comforted me and have spoken to the heart of your servant woman, though I am not like one of your servant women. Uh, at mealtime, Boaz says to her, "He come, come, you may eat of the bread, dip of the piece of the bread and vinegar. She sat beside the reapers, served her roasted grain. She ate, had some left. She rose again. Boaz commanded his young men, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves. Do not dishonor her. Also, you shall purposefully pull out some of the grain for the bundles, so that she may glean and do not rebuke her. Again, every scene in, as I'm calling, Act 2 today, Boaz just ups the ante, and he just continues to go above and beyond. Now he's saying, not only is she allowed to be in this field, and not only is he promising to protect her here, 
But he's telling the reapers, just pull out some of them and just let it fall down so that she can just come by and easily pick it up. I mean, he's just, he's, he's just overflowing in generosity here. Um, he gives instructions to his workers, and he tells them to, to also go above and beyond. Um, his generosity is abundant. Verse 17, she gleaned until evening. She beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. This, by the way, is an abundant amount to earn in just one day. Uh, this would feed her and Naomi for over a week, and it's just one day of, of gleaning here. Naomi is impressed, so now we move to, she's done for the day, she comes back to Naomi, she went to the city, her mother-in-law, that is Naomi, saw what she had gleaned, she took it out, she gave it to her, um, Naomi ate, was satisfied, her mother-in-law says, where did you glean today, where did you work, whoever took notice of you, may he be blessed, she tells him that it was Boaz. So it's obvious from the abundance that someone has taken notice of Ruth. Naomi observes this and asks where she went. She says it was Boaz. Now keep in mind that so far, Ruth does not know the family connection yet. Verse 1 told us, what did verse 1 tell us? That this was a kinsman, a relative to Elimelech. And now this is the first time that Ruth realizes it. Naomi, the one who goes around saying, call me Mara, because the Lord is against me, suddenly does a 180 in this moment, okay? She's been complaining, she's been murmuring, and, and we've said to be gracious to her, she's gone through a lot, we understand that, but she's been saying, you know, the Lord's hand is against me, and I went out full, and I came back empty, and all this kind of thing, and then all of a sudden, The synapses are firing, everything's being connected, and she realizes, wait a second, God actually is in this for good. (laughs) God actually is working something out here that I did not even anticipate. And she says, may he be blessed of Yahweh, who has what? God, this is, she said God was against her, and now she says that God has not forsaken his loving kindness to the living and the dead. Does an about face. And Naomi says to her, He is our relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. The Lord is working out this situation for good. Naomi sees the big picture now. She recognizes that God is not at work for evil, but for good. She credits the Lord with loving kindness, and she tells Ruth that Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. Sometimes a little bit of good theology goes a long way. (laughs) And that's exactly what's going on here. She recognizes uh, what is at work. Ruth says, uh, you know, tells her the whole story. Stay close to the young men until they finish the harvest. Naomi now says, listen, do that. (laughs) It's good because others in another field may oppress you. So she stays close by to the young women of Boaz in order to glean and she lived with her mother-in-law. So ends act two of the story. All right. This really is setting us up for chapters three and four, which is where we really start to see God's sovereignty and providence accelerate at a rapid clip. But for the meantime, how are we going to extract anything application-wise, out of this for our modern day. And I just have three points of application. And the first one is to be generous in your charity. We're going to take this directly from uh, Boaz, who went above and beyond in the particular situation that he was in. Now, probably most of us don't have fields today. And so we don't have the option to, uh, to leave the corners available. And if we did today, probably the deer would get at them, okay? So there's, we have to bring this into, what does this mean? Well, it means that we are supposed to do this, uh, kind of metaphorically speaking. We're not to spend every penny that we have because we are to leave some left over to be able to be charitable and kind to others. So be generous in your charity, give to others in need, provide for the destitute, 
don't do the bare minimum, instead go beyond. Most people in America today live on 125% of their income, okay? So the application here is live on 85% of your income, okay? And be kind with the rest of it or whatever the percentage is. That's the first application. Application number two is trust that God is at work in every area of your life. Don't assume that God is forsaking you just because things are difficult. This is what Naomi did. Call me Mara. Remember that Yahweh has not forsaken his loving kindness in verse 20. God is a good God, whatever you find yourself in. That's the second application. Application number three, take refuge under God's wings. God cares for his children and brings us through trials for his glory and our good. If you are in Christ, then run to him. We sung that song today. Run to Christ today for grace. If you are outside of Christ, I'm going to tell you how you run to him. Repent and believe in the gospel for salvation. He is enough. He is sufficient, and he will save you. Thank you, God, for your grace to us. We thank you for your kindness We thank you for this story in the book of Ruth. We pray that you might help us to apply these things to our own hearts, increase our trust in you and your loving kindness and the fact that you are at work for good and not for ill. We pray that you might help us to find hope in you in all things. We pray in Christ's name, amen.